Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the case surrounding Amanda Knox. Let's go ahead and start. I'm going to start talking about some of the body language that she's displaying here and how it relates to the story and everything that's centered around this. This is that part that I was telling you. So since it's hard to understand from this video, this is what happens. The police get the door open and they immediately usher Raphael and Amanda out of the apartment and they're all talking. She's hearing these words and she starts acting quite strangely. To be very fair to everybody who is cynical of Amanda, this is strange. She does the splits. But let's talk about what she's recounting here. She's saying, I never did a cartwheel. And she does the look where it's like, do you catch what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Teachers will use this. Parents will use this. Anytime that a person has had to say something or tried to tell somebody something multiple times and they're frustrated by it, they're going to do that look. It's very common. Look out for it and you'll see it a lot. So she does that look as if to be like, okay, do you get what I'm saying? And then she goes and says, I did do the splits. And she looks down and she flashes this expression of shame. She knew that was a dumb decision. She did the splits and her reasoning for it was that she was feeling stiff from standing there all day. And while I think that was a dumb move by her, why would you possibly see yourself needing to do the splits during this sort of situation or stretch like that at all? I also understand that it could just be her being detached. And this boils back down to her mindset in and of herself, regardless of this incident. She herself is very self-sufficient and she feels detached from those around her on some level. It's been made clear by the contempt smiles that she has even in the people that are close to her. And she also considers herself to be quirky. She says that in the Netflix documentary herself. So. Considering all of this, seeing somebody do the splits with that sort of personality complex makes a lot more sense. It's not a sign of guilt. It's literally just a sign of detachment. She doesn't have the emotional attachment to the situation quite yet. Coupled with that, it's a traumatic event and everybody acts differently during trauma. Where you might feel like some people would be screaming and losing their shit, that could be true in some cases. There are other cases where people seem totally fine until a moment and then they'll snap. That always happens at some point, a person who has gone through trauma will snap. This wasn't her time. She did not snap during this point. It's also gonna start talking about a kissing scene that will come up here and we'll keep talking a little bit more about this. Cartwheels, back walkovers, I did the splits and that's once. Okay, let's talk again here. She's recounting about a female police officer that she says spread all of these rumors about her doing more or less an entire gymnastics routine outside of this crime scene. And she's very defiant as she's doing it. Her gestures are very defiant. She has her chin raised. She's angry and defiant because she didn't do those things. I believe her at this point. I don't think she did any of those things. Also, there's no footage of it. There's no actual proof. It's just a he said, she said sort of situation. So I believe her in this point just because I've seen how synchronized her body is at all other points in the interview itself. Once again, when she mentions the splits, she looks down and flashes her shame expression. She thinks she's an idiot for having done the splits. And frankly, that was just a dumb move. That wasn't a well thought through move on her part because it was a heavily incriminating look for her to have at that moment. And Sawyer is about to bring that up as well. But do you see how strange well, what's strange is why these things got mischaracterized. But again, you can see that this does not look like grief. This does not look like grief. That's making a, a fundamental flaw in assumptions that many people have is that everything on how people compute and handle tragic trauma in their life is going to look the same as the next person. There's not always a normal way of coping with trauma. Ask any psychologist, they will tell you everybody does cope with trauma differently. While there are similarities, there are always differences. And chances are that's the case here, but let's keep watching. Does not read as grief. I think everyone's reaction to something horrible is different. And people kept saying, where is the anguish? 
where is what we think we would do if this happened to our friend? I've seen... Good question. Once again, let's talk about Amanda's psychology. If, if, and only if, the theory of her self-assuredness, self-sufficiency, individuality, and emotional separation from those around her due to her childhood, upbringing, and self-beliefs, if all of those are true, she doesn't have the same emotional connection as what you're assuming she would. You're assuming that she's best friends with Meredith. I don't think she was. I think she was friends with Meredith as close as Amanda could get to friendship. This could be the case with Amanda. I'm not saying it is, but so far it does seem to fit the nonverbal evidence. The same picture, like the kissing just can't stop. And that's not what that was. My friend had been murdered, and it could just have easily been me. We're going to talk about the kissing here. So what was shot, and you saw the little blip of it there, is that at that point, Amanda and her boyfriend have three small kisses. It's a peck, peck, peck. They're both very young. They're both very hormone-driven, as everybody is, at the beginning of a relationship. Keep in mind, only seven days into this relationship. Hormones are pretty much all they have to run off of. They only see that they like the way each other looks. Other than that, it's pretty watered down. So during times of stress, it's easier for a person's psychology to fall back on something that makes them happy or makes them feel good. That's a way that we cope with trauma. So during this time when she gives three kisses to her boyfriend, they weren't making out. And the media presented it that they were just like in the throes of passion off to the side of this crime scene. They weren't. It was actually just a lie. And I was really disgusted with how the media handled this on this situation. It was just a lie. And afterwards, if you look at her face here, you can see that she's not just like bubbling with joy. She just wasn't. It was still a stressful situation. If anything, she's blank. And that's a sign of detachment from a situation, especially a traumatic situation. So where the media was like, oh, they're just, they don't even care. They're just in love. And you can see they're just making out off to the side. It wasn't the case. Was it still odd? Sure, sure. There's not a single part of this case that wasn't odd. But is it the way that they painted it out to be? Absolutely not. Nor was it non-verbally displayed as such. Somehow, she had died in a house where we were living. And it could have been me. Did you kill Meredith Kircher? No. Were you there that night? No. Do you know anything you have not told police that you have not said in this book? Do you know anything? No. This is a really important question, and Amanda does not give satisfactory answers non-verbally to this. It's fishy, and I'm not able to say why, because there's just not enough evidence, but it is admittedly fishy. So when she says no the first time, it's a no largely, but it's a circular kind of no, and that's okay. The head shake thing is not always 100% reliable. So when she says no that first time, I would say that it's a no. She did not kill her roommate. When she's asked if she was there that night, she does a very odd display of tells. She says no, but it's a no, and then she nods her head down further. Now there's two reasons for this that this could possibly be. No could be used in affirmation of like no kind of thing. When you're saying something so authoritatively that you really want to hammer it home, a no is pretty common. And then that second nod, that could be either one, this is a severe nonverbal misalignment point, which is totally possible. And I'm keeping track of it as such as the rest of the read goes but it could also be subconsciously lowering a head like that is a sign of submission. It's showing that you are in fact lowering your gaze, lowering your head, you're making yourself smaller in the eyes of somebody else. It's a sign of vulnerability. So when she's doing that, she is either one, lying, or two, being vulnerable subconsciously. I have to keep both of these in mind throughout the rest of the read and consider this cluster, this odd cluster, in context of everything else. Because context in nonverbal reading is so absolutely crucial that if you don't do it, you can run into so many 
misunderstandings with it. And that's where a lot of people who do nonverbal reading and aren't as willing to do the context work, it takes more work to watch stuff in context, and they just see a small blip of it, then they'll just go off of that small blip and hang everything on that small blip. I actually want to take a moment here to talk about the prosecution and the lack of respect I have for how the prosecutor handled this and why. So according to the documentary, which he was doing the best he could to present himself as well as he could in this documentary, he started talking about how he's a fan of Sherlock. That's totally fine. Be a fan of Sherlock. But as soon as somebody says that they're a fan of Sherlock, especially on this channel with the amount of video content and study that I personally have done into Sherlock, I always get wary because I always see one common flaw in every Sherlock enthusiast who tries to pull it over into the work realm without enough study. And that's that they try to take small details out of context and hang everything on that. And sure enough, he says that he believes in Sherlock. And then the next line that he says is that he believes that the smallest details can have the largest implications. That can be true. That can absolutely be true. But, and this is a really big but that he ignored completely, is that it has to be observed in context still. For instance, the crime scene, the body was covered by a blanket. Now his immediate conclusion out of his mouth was that, oh, the body is covered by a blanket? That couldn't have been a man. A man wouldn't think of that. That's just idiocy. That's just idiocy. What the hell? Of course a man can think of that. Do you think that we're incapable of thinking of being like, oh, let's cover something? And then along with that, at a certain point in the interrogation where he was present, he said that she started beating her ears. Now this is a common sign of extreme distress and it is usually related to auditory, but his reasoning and the only one that he allowed to be thought about was that she was beating on her ears to block out the dying screams of her roommate. So poetic, right? Also totally unfounded, and there are a numerous number of different options for that. For instance, she had been in interrogation for so long that would you not want to get out of that situation audibly, visually, everything, if you're innocent? Would you not want to block that out? No, it had to have been that she was blocking out the screams of her dying roommate, which she killed. Along with that, he also does this thing to where he's like, it couldn't have been a break-in because there was a window that was broken, right? Odd. Like I said, there's a lot to this evidence. It's a nightmare. But he said that because the window was broken and he found no scuffs or markings on the wall underneath it, that it couldn't have been a break-in. Obviously, it had to have been an inside job. He didn't even mention that there's the possibility, one, of entering from a different route or two, that the person just didn't leave any trace on the wall when they climbed up it. He just ruled it out completely. And it's this mindset of taking facts to just kind of cram into an answer that you already have that really overrides everything that he held his prosecution with. He had a mindset. He had an answer when he went into it. He is a famous sex crime prosecutor. He went into this with an answer. He already knew his answer, and he found all the facts he could to fit that answer. And that's a disgusting betrayal of scientific and investigative method. I was disgusted with this prosecutor, and he was one of the biggest reasons that this continued to drag on. Anyway, that's my rant on him. Let's dive back into the body language. I don't. I wasn't there. So she says, I don't and I wasn't there. And she still is doing some odd things, but less odd than the time before. She is doing some lip compressions and some insecure gestures. And these can be explained once again, two different ways. One, it could be deceit. She could be lying. And all of this could be explained by that. Lying doesn't line up with the rest of the body language that we've been able to observe from her. Everywhere else, she's been very synchronized. And then this point, she's maybe not being synchronized, could be lying, it's true. Or alternatively, it could be all synchronized and all of this body language that we're seeing is her trying to work through an uncomfortable situation. A little tip from people who are doing interviews or have done interviews regularly is to sit quietly. It makes people uncomfortable and fill time. 
That is what you do. If you ask a difficult question, you just shut up and wait for them to answer it. And if they answer it and you don't like the answer, wait a little longer, they'll fill the time. That's what Sawyer did here, and Amanda filled the time. But she didn't fill it with any other lies. She just said, I wasn't there. She re-says what she already says. She doesn't give away any other extra details. She doesn't try to excuse anything else. She just says what she said before. This leads me as an interviewer, having been and conducted many interviews myself, this leads me to believe more that she's being honest than dishonest. But this is still only a partial picture. It has to be considered in context, and we're going to continue watching. I asked them if I should have a lawyer, and they said it would be worse for me. They knew what they were doing, and that is something that is unforgivable to me. So during this situation, the interrogators leave her with one option, and that's to confess to the crime. This is not unheard of. It's very effective for getting guilty people to confess this feeling of there's only one way out. But because of the very nature and the psychology behind it, it also can lend to many false confessions. There's only one way out, and that's how they exactly paint it. Everything else is so hopeless that the one way out of this situation is just to be able to tell that they did it, to admit to a crime. I feel like that's probably the case here. I don't know. So I'm not gonna say that she's obviously innocent from what I've seen so far. Let's watch and then we'll talk about it. But you confessed. Well, I didn't confess. I was interrogated. They acted like my answers. So real quick here, these are small ones, obvious ones and small ones. She says, I didn't confess, I was interrogated. She says, I didn't confess, and she does that same look. It's a coy, out of the corner of your eye kind of look. This is usually also common in contempt. It has that lopsided smile, but it's also like a playful sort of thing. And a, do you get what I'm saying? sort of feel to her words. But then what's more important is that she flashes very briefly and very minutely a disgust expression. The corner of her mouth raises, and that is an expression of disgust. She was not happy with how the interrogators handled it, and if she was innocent, I don't blame her. I don't blame her at all for being unhappy with that. If she was guilty, it's still also easily explained by disgust with the situation of them prying so hard and her not wanting to tell the truth. Regardless, disgust was in there, and I just wanted to make note of it. Were wrong. They told me I was wrong, that I didn't remember correctly, that I had to remember correctly. And if I didn't, I would never see my family. When they told me I had amnesia, it was the only reason I could think of of why they were treating me that way. All right, so we're seeing a lot of positive, reinforcing head movements. And this, actually, in relation to this, is enforcing the idea that when she said no earlier in regards to her being there that night, that's probably a positive reinforcement head nod. It's an accenting head nod. It's saying no. This is the same sort of case here. She's doing this reinforcing head nod the entire time. And talking about her verbiage here, building up this idea or excuses and avenues for a person to admit is part of interrogating. Making it easier for the person to admit their crime is part of interrogation. And with them being like, no, you're misremembering. Remember, you were high. You can't remember what happened there. So just admit that you were there and you did it. And she was high. She can't remember the exact details. She admitted that herself. And that makes it easier for her to say that she did it. Regardless of whether or not she did it, it just makes it easier. Human nature is that of water. It will take the path of least resistance when possible, especially under pressure. That happened here. I trusted them. And so when they... I trusted them and flashes another disgust expression. She really doesn't appreciate the law enforcement here. Pushed me about Patrick's message and told me to think, told me to remember that I had met him. I, I can only describe it as breaking down. She's being very careful with her words here. 
There's two reasons that that can be, but both of them kind of have the same mindset behind it. She has to choose her words wisely and she's doing so. This is either one because of guilt or two because she doesn't want to incriminate herself any further than she already has by doing this. And so while she's taking breaths and looking down, this is her tell of formulating her answer. Is it a sign of deceit? Absolutely not. Is it a sign of her really trying to figure out what she's wanting to say? A thousand percent. We know this. We've seen it. This is a pattern for her. So when she's saying that she only had one option out and they told her this is what must have happened, tell us that it happened this way and she's trying to figure out how to say it that way, she's really just trying to figure out how to choose her words wisely. This is another point that I just have to keep track of and understand in the context and then by the end of it, hopefully be able to make sense of. Right now, there's just not enough information to be like, oh, she's lying in this or she's not. I didn't know what I remembered and what I didn't remember anymore. It's so detailed. I heard Meredith screaming and I was scared and I covered my ears. I wasn't providing a lot of the detail. That's not detailed. I'm so sorry. I, I, I get what Sawyer's saying here that it's detailed, but that's not a detailed recollection. Who wouldn't think that they had to cover their ears or wouldn't be screaming? It's such an obvious thing that it's not, wow, this is just so unbelievably detailed that who else could have done it? Literally anybody could have come up with this. Duh. Meredith was murdered via a knife. It's a very loud murder, so there's probably going to be screaming. That's about as far as you need to know to come up with that detail. So this so detailed and the media presenting it as so detailed was just actual horseshit. I wasn't impressed by that. That's bad journalism. That's just clickbait journalism, and I can't stand that sort of stuff. But let's keep watching. They were asking me if I had heard Meredith scream. And when I said I didn't remember, they said, how could you not remember that she screamed? And I said, okay, I guess I remember that she screamed. It was all like that. But you signed it. And I signed it because I was incredibly vulnerable at that time. This is inconceivable to people that you lose yourself and then you talk about being there. It, it's, I don't know why it's inconceivable to people. Most people that it's inconceivable to just don't understand the pressure of an interrogation, regardless of whether or not you're innocent, especially if the force has shown that they want you to be guilty. If they want you to be guilty, it's an extremely stressful situation. And to be very fair to those people though, it's very hard to imagine that sort of situation when you haven't been in it. But that pressure when you're innocent and everybody in the law enforcement and everybody on everyone that you've talked to and the prosecution, the media, the citizens, everybody thinks you're wrong and that you're lying, it's extremely stressful. It's extremely stressful. So her behavior can be explained by lying and deceit and perhaps she is, or it could be explained by she's young, inexperienced, in a foreign land, also explainable. You talk about someone else doing it? I can try to explain what happened, and that's all I can do. I am still sorry to this day that I named Patrick the Mumba. But... I was demolished in that interrogation. All right, she is sorry. That's all affirmative. It's all synchronized. You can hear the emotion coming up in her throat. You could see it start in the tenseness under her eyes. These are all involuntary movements most of the time. Don't get me wrong, could be a brilliant liar. Don't see that, but it could be. Along with that, right afterwards, she shows her defiance again, her individuality. She has to be self-sufficient and she shows that by raising her chin up. And this is still characteristic and fits the psychological type that I feel she has of this self-sustained, self-sufficient view of herself. And when you see it that way, all of this does make a lot more sense, but I'm not sold totally on it. So I just wanna be able to keep observing, keep analyzing, keep gathering data. Data is honestly my best friend. This is what I'm up against. And when they finally told me they had to take me to the jail, I did not understand why. And they said, it's for your protection. We're protecting you. 
did it again. She really does not like the police force. She says, we're protecting you. And then you could see it just before it cuts here. She does a little tiny flash of a disgust again. She does not like the police force there. I understand if she's innocent, I wouldn't like the police force that tried their hardest over so many years to try to get me to go to prison for a thing I didn't do. I'd have disgust too. Or she's a liar and she does not like the police force for trying to catch her in her act. Both are possible. One is becoming less and less possible as I observe and continue to watch her body language. I didn't realize how very intensely I was being scrutinized. I'm not the best speaker. Does it look hard, hardened, unfeeling? I can see how it does. You thought you were going to be acquitted. How could I be convicted? That's what I was thinking. That's a good question. Either one, it was never even considered to be a lie because it was so quick. It's just a gut response. Like, what, what do you mean? Was I anticipating being acquitted? How was I possibly convicted? That's a great question if you're innocent. Or she's rehearsed that so much as a lie that it's just a gut reaction. I don't think she's that good of a liar. From what I've seen so far, from how much she's worn all of her emotions on her sleeve, I don't think she's that good of a liar. I think that's more of a gut reaction. I don't know. I can never know for certain in body language, but from what I've seen, I don't think that that was a, a lie in that situation. I can't go over all the evidence, but just to hit, they testified it was her DNA. And it was proven that they were wrong. They have said that you cleaned the room somehow, or you cleaned the premises of your DNA. Well, that's impossible. I'm gonna talk about this. It doesn't even matter her body language in this section. The science alone from that dumbass opinion of she cleaned her DNA from a crime scene, the science alone, the difficulty of that alone just shows that they are trying so desperately to fit a crime to an answer they already have, to fit the, the facts to their answer. They're implying that this 20-something-year-old American girl in a foreign land somehow, beyond all science and physical possibilities, went into a room, a crime scene, and cleaned up exclusively her DNA without leaving any evidence of any cleaning having happened. That's not possible. It's just not. Even with the best tools and assets, it would be extremely time consuming and extremely difficult, borderline completely impossible for somebody to remove a specific DNA. So to be able to suddenly go from being pretty sheltered from her parents' home to being abroad and this master killer doesn't make sense. It's such a weird reach, such a weird reach. But nevertheless, that's the reach that was done again and again and again for eight years. We're gonna watch a little bit more of this and then I'm just gonna summarize and we'll close it up from here. Um, it's impossible to see DNA, much less identify whose DNA it is. I remember being both humbled and mortified by that because in my mind it was still all a big mistake and it would be shown to be a big mistake guilty colpevole and it was a roar in the courtroom people exclaiming my mom and my sister crying this mindset that's being shown here with the courtroom it's obvious that everybody wanted her to be guilty they just wanted her to be guilty. The media was one of the biggest culprits for that. The media were just disgusting. One of the head journalists in the propagation of all of this showed very clearly the only thing he cared about beyond checking facts was the clickability of a title, the viewability of a title, and having his name under it. All that he cared about was that it was a good story. He didn't care if it was an accurate story. Sure, he did research, but he only did it so far. His drive was to get it out before other people, and sadly, this is what's true so much in the media. Having worked side by side with the media before, I can say for certainty that this is disgustingly 
so much of the drive is just getting it out there first, not necessarily getting it out there correctly. And that's frustrating because in this situation, I think the media was one of the biggest reasons that everybody hated on Amanda Knox during this. Everybody wanted her to go to prison for this. And I think it's the fault of the newspapers, the news stations, the social medias, and everything surrounding that. Just trying to maintain clickability, readability, and getting it out there fast. Not maintaining facts. Not maintaining truth. Just being clickable. And that's disgusting to me. That's so such a slummy kind of mindset to have. I hate that. One of the biggest reasons that I cut ties with doing things in the media. And I couldn't breathe. And I couldn't, I couldn't reach them. And I lost it. Everything that I thought I knew about the way justice and life worked was gone. It's gonna go off and talk about some more extraneous details that I'm not gonna cover in this video because this is already a really long video and also because I don't think it's relevant to the case. So when it's talking about her losing it, I think that's an important point to talk about here because this is that breaking point, like I said. Everybody has a breaking point. It's just a matter of when and how it's gonna happen. This is likely hers. This is the time that people wanted to see, this is the Amanda that people wanted to see at the crime scene. This destroyed, sobbing, broken person. It's not the person they saw there. This only hit home for Amanda once she really got this verdict, that she was guilty, she was found guilty. And at that point, she loses it. Like she said, she loses it. And the reason that I think it took so long to get to her, not only one, because she was likely innocent in this situation, all of the nonverbal communication that we've been able to compile seems to point to that more so than her being guilty. Nonverbal communication is at best 70 to 80% accurate, so you have to really look at everything. But from the nonverbals that she's displayed, it's pointing more towards her innocence. So if she's innocent, it won't hit as hard yet because she still feels that she's gonna be okay, she's innocent. Along with that, she is that self-sufficient, partially self-absorbed young person from America, and she's defiant against this. She feels like she's gonna be okay. And with those types of people, with people that are very self-sufficient and possibly self-absorbed, it takes a little bit longer for the reality of things to kick in. And usually when it does kick in, it's at extreme moments. So when she just found out that she has been found guilty, that's a pretty extreme moment and probably exactly when she found her breaking point. Non-verbally speaking, as we observed throughout all of this information that we just collected, and along with this, the hours and hours and hours of study that I did before this video, I found her to be largely innocent. Suspicious? Totally. I understand that point, but innocent. I don't think she was guilty. She doesn't have the demeanor to do it. She wasn't a violent person. Also, some facts about the roommate, they were similarly sized, and the roommate was known to have taken martial arts. So that kinda implies that she knows how to handle herself at least to a degree. So to assume that Amanda, who doesn't have martial arts training, is a similar size to the other girl, came in there and killed her, not likely. One of the theories is that she had two other people doing it. She manipulated her boyfriend and this other guy into doing it as some sort of weird satanic cult thing. Also, not really any evidence for that, neither in her past nor physically. It was just like one of those fantastical ones brought up by the amazing prosecution who was known and had a reputation of being a sex crime prosecutor. But here's where it gets really interesting to me. I suggest you go and look up all of the evidence yourself as well so you can kind of hopefully see this. But speaking evidence-wise, there was a gentleman who was there that night and said on record that he was there the night that 
Meredith was killed. His excuse, his reason for him saying that it wasn't him, was that he said he went to the bathroom with his iPod and he was listening to music on the toilet with his iPod, he said for about 10 minutes. And during that time, Meredith was killed by an intruder and this gentleman came out of the bathroom just in time to see a figure of a man run out of the house. I was like, are, wait, hold on. Let's just think critically for just a tiny second on this. This is an upstairs apartment and it's small. I don't know how many of you have lived on an upstairs apartment that's small, but if somebody, even in the adjacent apartment, which is much further than just the adjacent room, if somebody in the adjacent apartment like drops something heavy, you can feel that. You could just feel that. So say, say he was in the bathroom and he did have his iPod all the way on full blast to where he couldn't hear the screams of a person being killed next door, like quite literally a room or two over. Say that's all true and he just couldn't hear it because he, his eardrums were bleeding from the loudest music known to man. Say that's true, he would still have felt it. I don't care. You would feel that kind of struggle. There were evidence of a large struggle in the room. Stuff was tossed about. She was a martial artist. There would have been a very large struggle. But his reasoning was that somebody else did it. All in all, his testimony was way more suspicious. Also, along with that, he has a history for breaking and entering, which a person who does crimes is more likely to do more crimes than a person who does no crimes is to go to the extreme of doing this kind of crime. I'm not saying that that's a reliable stream of thought, but that is a commonality in criminals. They start off somewhere and they escalate. That being said, you tell me what you think. Does that make more sense? The person who had a record and who's admitted to being there that night and whose DNA is found at the scene, including inside the crime scene itself, or the 20 year old American girl who had no history of violence, has no record and has no capability of killing a roommate who knows karate quite well in such a brutal, physical, violent way. You tell me, but this is just a nonverbal read Everything that you have heard here is subject to interpretation and at best nonverbal reading can only be 70 to 80% accurate with some leniency on either side. So I hope this all makes sense to you. If you enjoyed this style of video and would love to see more true crime content, there's a few things you can do to let me know. One, you could like the video. Two, you can subscribe. And three, you can ding the bell. Everybody knows those. In the comments, let me know, one, your opinion. If you disagree or you agree, let me know what that is. And then if you have any other requests, that's the place to let me know as well. I will hold polls to be able to choose the most popular requests. If you would like to make it possible, the links in the description of true crime videos are the ways that I can make them happen. So big shout out to my patrons this time because they really kind of helped make this video possible. I hope you enjoyed it, but, but, Without further ado, that's all that I've got for today. My name is Logan and you, you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys.